Hey everyone, if you're a fan of the show, please head over to MikeyOp.com and click the subscribe button. It's the best way to support us, and it's free. That's M-I-K-E-Y-O-P-P dot com. Thanks! Hi, I'm Mike Oppenheim, and you are listening to Coffin Talk, exit interviews with the living, a weekly podcast that explores how our views on death affect the way we live our life. This week, coming all the way from British Columbia, Canada, is Sahar Razai, and she's actually an expert in many things. Among those are transpersonal psychology, and uh, she also grew up in the Philippines and then immigrated to Canada, where she has lived for many years, and we're going to learn a lot more about her. So everybody say hi and say hi back, Sahar. Hey. So yeah, a uh, normal standard question I ask people just so they can be familiar with the guest is, um, how old are you, where did you grow up, and what generation do you belong to, if any? I uh, was born in Philippines, and so I moved to Canada when I was about seven. Uh, currently, I'm 33 years old. I would say I don't belong to any generation. I'm um, a unique duck, but uh, if I were to be put into that category, I believe it's Generation X. <laughs> See, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, no. <laughs> no, no, no. I think you're a hardcore millennial by their standards. I also think that it's an American, North American thing. So I actually think you would be exactly what you said. What was it? Did you say odd duck? Odd duck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would go with that. I think that's good, actually. I've known you for about four years now, and I would say that's exactly what I would call you. As a compliment, just in case anyone listening thinks that's an insult. And actually, we met in Ecuador at a retreat, which I'll let you uh, get into if you feel like it later. And then you ended up actually volunteering there. So um, you have a lot of interests and a lot of ground to cover but i know that when we became friends it was almost like spirituality first everything else second which is why i've been really excited to interview you because this podcast uh welcomes people from all walks of life including atheists but we still talk about spirituality so i'm going to just jump right into the main main question we always ask guests um because with you i think it's appropriate to start that way uh what do you think happens when you die i believe that when people die uh all of us i believe that we our body obviously leaves like our spirit leaves our body and we just become consciousness so i don't believe we're actually dead our body our ego has it's like an ego death basically and we're still alive and i do believe that we reincarnate but uh as far as that i don't really know what happens (laughs) that's all i got so far and when you say that's what i got so far uh how do you think you got that even that far Well, I've actually read a lot of books on spirituality. And then when I also think about the time where um, I would say I had an ego death and it was for months on end um, and I I felt like, like, okay, so I'll go into that a little bit because I believe this is like when I think about consciousness and spirituality, I think about how we just transcend the ego mind. And so when I was living in that state, it was just like, there was no uh, separation. That was a big one for me. There was no separation for me and the other person. And all I felt was like, I, you, I couldn't even describe it. I think that when you heard my constitution, I actually spoke about love. <laughs> and I spoke about unconditional love, um, not human love, but it was just this expansive energy. So when I think about when we die, I believe we turn into that energy. And I believe that energy is love um, and it's, it's not separate and it's i believe that it's around all the time it's just that we have to have the ability to tune into it does that make sense oh it it totally makes sense to me uh one of the things i love i'm going to repeat back because i like to do that for our audience and myself is that love is an energy not just like a thing you have between humans i love that and then you did say something that i want you to clarify for the audience you said in my constitution can you explain what you were referring to Yeah, so I just graduated from a three-year program in transpersonal psychology. Okay, uh, I do want you to explain that, and then I guess the more brief question that begs to be answered before that, just really quickly, is that you said um, it was for months. So what's the context as far as, like, how old were you when you had this experience that for months you were, uh, you had experienced an ego death? So it was about, I think I was about 27, 28, and I think it lasted about... I would say six months and can I go into how it happened? Yeah, that's what I'd like you to tell that and then we'll get to transpersonal. That way we're kind of keeping an order. So yeah, because that's a pretty profound statement and it's not that I don't believe you. It's just, it's very profound. Like, I mean, you were experiencing something that I'm looking forward to. (laughs) So let's hear about it. 
Right. And when people, you know, when people, when, like when you say this, not that I don't believe you, it, the thing is, it's hard to believe when you don't have the actual experience yourself. It's something that logic can't define. It's an experience that you have to have. Um, yeah, you can't really measure it. So what had happened in my first year was I was going in, into some shadow work, um, you know, integrating a lot of disown aspects of myself. So one of them I spoke about was in the past was Mimi Bobic. You know, she's loud, she's obnoxious, <clears throat> all of these things. And so, you know, I, I got to step into really uncomfortable situations that allowed me to, although I was uncomfortable, it allowed me to kind of own those disown aspects. And, and a few other things um, throughout the journey really helped me open up. And what was happening was that I was actually opening up my heart like I've never felt before. Um, and if anyone has read The Untethered Soul, um, basically what happens is when you have an emotional imprint, it uh, gets trapped in your heart like a, a traumatic emotional imprint. So what starts happening when you do a lot of inner work is that when you open your heart to situations where you would normally contract, you start opening up your energy centers in a way that um, really allows you to expand, um, you know, and it brings down a lot of your barriers. Like during that time as well, I worked on a lot of sexuality stuff where I had disowned that aspect. So it was so much inner work that, you know, when I, when I was doing it, I was also in a group of people where I can connect with. And that really helped me develop that, um, ability to feel compassion and love. And it was like, I guess I would consider it as like, it was like a daily practice that I was really getting into. And once that um, feeling was constantly um, felt in, on a daily basis, it was like I was impressing and recreating and reprogram, reprogramming myself in my mind. So I think that's when I actually started opening up and had that awakening expansive experience, not to mention reading a lot of Wayne Dyer and trying to transcend my ego as, as well. So that made a huge difference. So it is fair to say there was effort involved on the beginning part and like an attention to it. And then it was kind of cultivating it and then it happened. And by the way, side note, I love the untethered soul. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're, yeah, 99% sure you're the one who told me to read it. Yes. So I recommend that to anyone re uh, listening to this. And so what excites me is that then you entered this and it was like working what makes me um, sad because I want it to be permanent is that it's, you, you said it only lasted for a few months. So could you explain the coming out of it or like why you think that happened or just kind of, can you talk on that? Yeah, absolutely. I know exactly why it happened and I've been trying to figure out uh, how to work on that piece for these last few years since it happened. So what happens is when you know, we spend so much time, like I was spending so much time every single day trying to cultivate this mindset, this heart set, and this deep spiritual, you know, practice that I would do. And I, I had integrated that into my life. And there's still unresolved things that I didn't work on. And so a few months after that, like my focus as someone who's 27 was like, you know, career making money, and then like, you know, getting into a relationship. And, but that was like unresolved things that I didn't really look at. I was still getting into the same like patterns, like getting into like dysfunctional jobs or like dysfunctional relationships. And so uh, during like my awakening, even though I was able to hold my alignment and be at a place where like nothing can affect me externally, um, when you start getting into that personal level and, and then it starts hitting on your like deeper stuff, that's when I realized that like I was getting hurt a lot by different situations like at work and this relationship that I had. And that's when I started to close. And it was an, like, it was like I went unconscious, not realizing like what had happened to me to begin with, like the, the awakening piece where my senses, my senses have actually heightened. You know, I was able to pick up energy like I never could before. And um, so to begin with, not knowing what's actually happening to me and, and then also like absorbing people's energy, not understanding that piece until I met Mike. Oh, Mike me. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you. And then, and then also getting hit with, with those um, unresolved issues, like, you know, in, in relationships, like mine was 
or is codependent uh, pattern. So I had I had a lot of unresolved things that I was supposed to work through, which I didn't, um, and that put me back into a position where like I was completely out of alignment. So is it fair to say that there's love that is a powerful energy that knows no boundaries and doesn't care about who is who and what is what and what love is loving love. But then is it also fair to say that what actually brought you out of this egoless state of love was ironically like a quest for love with a partner on earth? I would say that. And then also work like my, my ego was still like, I was, you know, it was a job where I was making a lot of money and it was a really good job. And so, you know, um, I wasn't, I probably disconnected from my intuition and, and I should have listened, but you know, your, your SOSs, which is your suspicions of self, like your wounds come up and you, and you don't realize. And so my pattern was always like sacrificing myself for that job or for that relationship. So having that awareness now, it's like, you know what, I take it as a learning experience, but what I want more than anything is actually to have that spiritual connection where I am feeling that expansive love and then like putting that first and foremost so that, and listening and trusting my intuition, like trusting that was always so hard for me because, you know, growing up, my father was always minimizing my feelings or I was not, uh, I had a hard time trusting myself, um, because of uh, those relationships that I had with my caretakers, right? Especially with my dad. It's like, how could you trust yourself when like my self-esteem was so shattered all the time and I felt so low. So now it's like really connecting back to my heart and, um, and getting in touch with that part of me and really owning that and honoring that. So had you chosen to stay in this state of ego death and never gone back to a career or a partner, how could that have looked? Like what sort of model is there? Cause, uh, cause where I'm getting confused is not how you got in, but how, when you were already in, you got like distracted by what wasn't there. Does that make any sense? Yeah. So you're wondering how I got pulled out of it. Is that more? Yeah. So I, I think what happened was because all of these, okay, so when I was having my awakening experience and going to school, I actually wasn't working that year because a year before that I got hit by a car crossing the street. And so I had all of this time to myself to integrate the spiritual practices uh, into my life. And then when I was working and then going to school and then the relationship, it was like, you know, I have this habit of taking on too much. And so when there's taking on too much, I didn't, uh, didn't really feed or nourish my needs. So it was like, I put the spirituality on the back burners. Yeah, that, that, that really makes sense. So that's what the like little question I had in the back of my mind was, okay, so cause I had, um, it wasn't similar at all, but I was hit by a car once and I had a year to like, you know, it wasn't, I wasn't rich, but I had like the, you know, the lawsuit settlement and everything was going on. So and I had medical stuff being covered. And I remember like the space, I, I didn't choose to use it for anything worthwhile. But my point is, and actually ironically, I was 27 as well. Um, but it was a profound period of my life and I remember it very well. And then it sounds like, I, I understand everything that happened with you. Um, and it's a really interesting story. So now obviously someday you're gonna get back there. And I'm saying that, I'm, you didn't say that, but I, I believe you will. And my, my question is, can a person get back to that state while they do have a job, a career and a family and everything? I think that a big lesson for me in this, like they can do that, but it's, you know, you have so many roles, right? The, the, okay, I want to put it this way, actually. The ego has so many roles, right? I, I'm the caretaker, I'm the wife, I'm the husband, you know, I got to accomplish this and that. And uh, what's missing is like, like people can get there, but we have to learn to like really tune into ourselves. And I think that was the missing piece. Like, that inner bonding within myself, like connecting to that, as long as you're making time in your day to do that, and then also integrating that into your life, like in every moment, then I believe it's possible, but it's just more so allowing that spiritual aspect of your life to lead instead of like your human um, conditions or circumstances, if that sense, right? That's really well said. That, that gels really well with me. And that kind of gets me into the next question I have. And then we're going to jump into transpersonal psychology, which is just simply, um, as far as morality is concerned, 
do you see when you're in that ego death state, do you see like bad people and good people or do you just not see that? No, I love, I love that question because like, like thinking about that actually makes me really emotional because what I loved most about living in that state was when there was someone who did not like me, who judged me, who just like any of that, or if I felt any negativity or anger towards them, I was able to just have a lot of compassion for them because I was feeling that within myself. Like that's, I was embodying love and compassion. So that's all I could feel, right? Because I was nurturing that. So uh, that's why I like, I get emotional about it. Cause it's like, man, imagine if you could just love somebody that just hated you. Like, I think that's such a beautiful thing. Like to feel that in your heart, like it doesn't matter what, what the other person thinks. Like I, I'm, I'm so in love with like who I am and I just want to love everybody else. And what was happening for me, like, I remember there would be uh, some people that, you know, didn't like me. And I just like, I, I could pick up, like, it was like, you know, an insecurity or jealousy more so, um, like it was specific women. And I, I thought to myself, like, I've totally been in that situation and I just like totally feel that pain. And so um, I just want to like offer that compassion, like energetically. So that's what the feeling was. That is so cool. And that really ties a nice ribbon on this entire part of this discussion, because I, I feel very complete now with like how it worked for you, what it felt like and how I can attain that and work towards it. Um, and then also just what it is that we're trying to all get to, which is a point where yes, someone can dislike you and yes, someone can even hurt you or do something quite nasty to you. But if you can seek this space of love, you'll have compassion for them and the rest wouldn't matter. So let's kind of like jump into um, the last thing I really want to discuss with you. And then of course, if you have more you want to say, uh, you'll have the floor. But uh, could you define transpersonal psychology for everyone listening? Like give like the most, you know, scholarly definition you can come up with and then just jump right into like why you pursued it and what it's been like. And I'll stop you if I have any questions or if you need anything, just let me know. Sure. It, it's funny you ask me this because I always like have this feeling like, oh, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to explain this right. So let me just let whatever comes out, come out. When I when I think about transpersonal psychology, like, so there's traditional psychology where, you know, you're just talking it out. <laughs> it's just more so you're in your head, you're talking it out. When I think about transpersonal psychology, I think about like mind, body, spirit. So like the spiritual aspect. So you're transcending your ego. It's not all about the, you know, mind. So like the, the, the program that I took, we do a lot of like somatic work, which is like body-based work, really tuning into the emotional piece and then integrating like your mind and your body. So it's like, it's like getting the client to um, feel their feelings and then kind of understand that in a logical sense. So, okay, back to transpersonal psychology. So I just think it's like, yes, yeah, spirituality and psychology put together, but asking the deeper questions like, who am I? Like, why am I here? Like, what is the purpose of the dark night of the soul? Like, and it's really trying to find like more purpose and meaning into the darker aspects instead of thinking that it's all about suffering. So it's coming out of that and really connecting to the truth of who we are. And I believe again, that's like love. And I believe that we're not, we're not separate. So so that's my definition of transpersonal psychology. So, so yeah, so that, first of all, I loved your definition. Thank you. And there was no issues with that. So I feel good to move on and hear about like, I guess, just why did you enter it? What did you learn? Uh, and what could you tell our listeners that might help them if they're interested in it? Yeah. So why I entered it, that, that was the time when I, I got hit by a car. I, you know, I was in a relationship that was unfulfilling. Um, and I was, oh, I always felt really insecure and low about myself, especially growing up uh, with my dad, who, you know, I, I actually really care about him now. But, um, you know, he was very violent growing up and very critical. So I had really low self-esteem and low self-worth. And uh, so that drew me into looking within myself. And a lot of uh, a big part of the program is actually you doing your own inner work. So your life is the curriculum. Like this program is like 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 no other because you actually have to 
go into it like as if you're a client. You have to go into looking at the dark stuff, the shadow stuff. And I would recommend this because I believe that most people resist the dark stuff. And um, there's a lot of disowned pieces within ourself that that I realized, you know, it's such a gift to embrace those parts. And when we're, uh, we give ourselves permission to be, um, like, for instance, my family system, there was no crying. You're not allowed to cry. You're not allowed to show your feelings. Uh, no hugging. Um, sexuality is inappropriate. Um, so a lot of those parts of me were shut down. And when I learned to just acknowledge and embrace those parts, I actually started to feel more connected to my authentic self. And I realized that the resistance was what was keeping me from growing in all areas of my life, from relationships, career, to like feeling complete within myself. And I really believe that's really what's missing. Like when we have walls in our lives and it's, I believe it's all internal. So taking this course really allowed me to dig deep into those places that allowed me to accept myself in a way that I never thought I could. And um, and you're really like, I think it was two weeks ago you graduated and it was awesome. I got to see your speech and everything, which is why the Constitution thing came up and we're still going to get to that. But real quick, um, you keep referring to the shadow stuff. Can you give like a concrete example of that? It doesn't have to be from your life, but like what would be a, a shadow thing that people like don't want to face yeah, so there's the collective shadow, for instance. So I think about, like, all of the violence, all of the stuff in the news. Like, I believe that we're, people watch that. They're kind of addicted to it. And I believe underneath that there's there's a part of us that's that's all kind of like that. There's a little bit of the violence. So we're, we're unfortunately, people are drawn to that. Like, it's I think about the reptilian brain. So it's just the, sh the darker parts of ourself that we've disowned. Like, again, there's the sexuality. Um, there's, you know, for me, anger is one that I really struggled with. So that was, that was disowned until I could, oh, another one I have to, I, I love this example. So last year in class, I had, um, there was someone in my class who just took up so much space and I felt like she was always the one taking up space and it super triggered me until the end of the year, what I had realized was because I was constantly minimizing my feelings and not speaking up and that it triggered me because I felt like she was selfish. But then until I started doing it and really owning my feelings and who I am and, and taking on that, like that spit space and, and sharing with others, that's when I realized it was just my own stuff. And it, I wasn't giving myself permission to do that and to show up um, in, in a group. So I actually had a conversation with her and it was about it. And I expressed how it was so triggering for me, but, and I realized like I took accountability and I said, you know what, that actually taught me a lot. And my projection had nothing to do with you. It was actually all me. You just showed me what I needed to work on. Wow. Okay. That was a great example. And that really like brought it together for me. So, I mean, I can clearly think of a thousand shadow issues I have now, what I'd like to clarify, and this is so perfect for this podcast, is that like some people think there's really like a binary like uh, system to morality. There's good and there's bad and there's everything could be classified into one or the other. But you're making it sound a little more complicated because you use the word violence and you used it appropriately. But then you said we're attracted to it. That all makes sense within anyone's scheme. But then what you're saying is that violence. I No, no, hold on. You are not saying this. I am asking you, did you say that like basically violence and anger are not good or bad they're just the things you have to face Ooh, that's a tough one because <laughs> wow okay so i don't agree with violence uh obviously um and but i believe that we all have that within ourselves like i feel like you know we're just neanderthals <laughs> ultimately yeah the reptilian brain here but I, and I don't think anger is wrong it's just that how you how you use your anger like are you using it in a way that you know you're because it's important to feel everything even your anger so uh yeah so anger is anger is good <laughs> so like if you had a client or if you had a friend even and like they said to you like I have these like angry violent urges and I don't know what to do with them 
Like, is there a transpersonal psychology answer to that? I actually just kind of tune into what they're experiencing and meet them there. The, the most important thing uh, when I work with a client is that they're seen and that they're met, met and that they feel safe and I'm not judging them because in order for them to work through that, I need to meet them there and I need to meet them with love and compassion. And so I've had, you know, clients who were extremely felt like they had violent, crazy uh, feelings or like really another one was like heavy sexual attention. And, you know, uh, yeah, I just, met them there because if someone doesn't hold them there in that space, then they might feel like they're being judged and it won't, it might not turn out like appropriately. Right. But when you meet them there and try to figure out like what's really going on underneath that, um, then they have more of an opportunity to heal that. Cause when I think about anger, I think underneath anger is just a cry for love. It's just something like deep inside so so that's why it's really important to for me to meet someone just there that's a beautiful quote um i love that that's a great like sentiment for our audience and for me to reflect on i mean i i am so thankful sahar this was really interesting i mean we're like good friends we talk all the time but i don't get to hear you talk about your passion as much as i want to so thank you so much for taking time today is there anything you want to add i just want to say thanks for having me like i really enjoyed um our well i know you didn't talk as much but i just really enjoyed your questions and really delving into it because i don't think i've been asked these questions so it was really fun for me and you know i hope that um i gave you know the viewers some value so thank you so much for having me on here i really appreciate everyone you definitely gave our listeners uh, value. You gave me a ton of value. I have tons of more questions. And I, at a certain point, I'm going to start having guests back on with follow-ups and stuff. And you you are a definite person I'm going to have back on because I am not done with the litany of questions I could ask. But for today, it's going to have to be enough. So thank you so much, Sahara Zai from Canada for helping us put another nail in the coffin. As always, my name is Mike Oppenheim, and you have been listening to Coffin Talk, Exit Interviews with the Living. And we will see you soon.